Um, next, we're going to be having the uh, use of JPSS to support the NOAA operational missions presented by Dan Netfeld. Uh, Dan has over 26 years working with NOAA. Most of the time was with the National Weather Service. He has spent 15 years at the Science Operations Officer at the WFO in Omaha, Nebraska, where his primary responsibilities include managing and training and research programs, as well as ensuring scientific and technical quality in NOAA's National Weather Service products and services. He's currently with NOAA's Office of Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. Welcome. Thank you, Christy. Yeah, do I need to? Sorry. It's all right. There you go. Make sure you use the pointer. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you, Christy. Hey, good morning. It's great to be here. Um, I think Mitch gave a, gave a really good overall talk about good introduction to JPSS and some of the capabilities. I'm going to take us just a little bit deeper into the forecast operations of NOAA or the National Weather Service in particular. And my background um, allows me to do this a little bit. I, most of my, my career, as Christy mentioned, was with the National Weather Service. So I spent 25 years in weather service operations. Ten of those years I was a forecaster and then for 15 years I was in a position called the Science and Operations Officer which I primarily manage the training and research programs, um, but Mitch mentioned the, the proving ground activities for JPSS and GOES-R, and uh, our office participated in those from about 2009 uh, to 2015. So it was really uh, interesting to see some of the new technology and products that were coming out of the, the, the satellite in, uh, community and put those to the test, see what what would really work in operations, so it would help our operations, and uh, that was just an exciting uh, activity to be a part of. So this is somewhat simple, but um, if you're in operations, if you're an operational forecaster or hydrologist, um, you know, basically you're trying to, to answer three simple questions. Uh, what's happened or is happening or is about to happen with, whether it be the atmosphere or the rivers or the coastline or the, whatever ecosystems, again, Mitch showed quite a few ecosystems, things like drought. Um, so what's happening with that? Will it have a high impact on society? That's a fairly big question too. You know, tomorrow's temperature forecast might have somewhat of an impact on society, but if we have a big flash flood in Austin, that would have a huge impact on society. So that's what we're curious about. And then how can we best communicate that information to decision makers? And this is a little bit of a, of a gradual shift in weather service operations and priorities. You know, 20 or 30 years ago, the weather service took a lot of pride in putting out the forecast, but then they, they just sort of sent out the forecast and didn't really ask too much about what was happening from there. That's totally different now. Now, um, they're really interested in communicating important information to the people who really need that. So again, there's been somewhat of a shift, and, and we basically are, are coining this as um, decision support services. And again, that's primarily for the really high impact weather. So uh, that's really what we'll focus on, and I think that's a lot of what JPSS is able to help us with. A little bit more on that shift, um, and this is, some people could argue with me a little bit on this, but generally speaking, if I wanna know the high temperature let's say next Saturday in Austin. You know, I as a human forecaster could try to figure that out using my traditional forecasting methods, or I could grab my phone. And, and that forecast off my phone, which comes from wherever, is probably going to be just as accurate as what I can come up with. That's due largely to all the great data that JPSS and other polar orbiters are putting into the models, as Mitch spent some time talking about. So it's a little bit ironic. Um, but the point is, again, for tomorrow's high temperature forecast, we can get that from a model more or less in an automated fashion. And that's okay, because again, that's, that's getting quite accurate. But the really high impact weather, things like flash flooding and tornadoes and the other things that were on the slide before, that's really below the capabilities or beyond the capabilities of most models. So that's really where the humans continue to play a huge role and because that is beyond the capabilities of both mo uh, most models, hopefully I can convince you 
the operational data is really the key for, um, for trying to communicate this information out. Quick example of this, I know this is a, a radar slide, so forgive me, but um, I just wanted to show, this is from a few years ago, but it, it just shows that we've got some thunderstorms in central Nebraska, and you know, thunderstorms are relatively high impact, obviously, some of them more than others, but this is showing the GFS model, a global forecast system model. It's the six hour forecast. So this isn't the 144 hour forecast, this is the six hour forecast for all these slides that I'm gonna show. And those purple lines basically show where the rainfall is at. And you can see that, unfortunately, um, the rain is occurring outside of all those purple lines. Well, the global forecast system, is a, it's a global model, so maybe you wouldn't quite expect that, um, the, the, that it would be extremely accurate with, with thunderstorms. But we'll, we'll kind of zoom in a little bit more with some other models here. This is actually a Canadian model, also a global model. It's actually a little bit better with its precipitation forecast, but still outside the lines. Now we've got the NAM, higher resolution, and uh, you can see a little bit more precision there, but still uh, missed the rainfall quite a bit. This is the ARW core model, and now we've got resolutions that's down in the four kilometer range, so more convective allowing. Really missed the precipitation. This is another one, another variety of those, also missed it. The HER model, Mitch mentioned this, this is a fairly new model that's actually not too bad. And you can see it's closer, but again, if, if I'm underneath a thunderstorm, it's, uh, it's not quite close enough. And then just showing that all of those models together, they all miss the rain. They all miss the thunderstorm activity. And this is really common. I mean, I grabbed this the other day, but, but I could show you this for probably any precipitation system, especially a convective system that's occurring in the United States. So just really trying to hit home that a lot of what we're seeing that's really high impact can't be accurately predicted by the models too much. You've probably seen this slide. This is just a typical scale definition slide. It's in a lot of textbooks. And on the left there is time ranging from a second at the bottom to a month at the top. And then on the bottom, it's 20 meters on the left all the way to 100 kilometers on the right. And in the upper right, those are the things that, again, those are large scale systems, synoptic scale systems. And for the most part, NWP is handling those really well. If I'm a human forecaster and I want to try to figure out where a big upper ridge is going to be in a week, I'm going to use a model, no question about it. But if you look at some of those other smaller things, again, tornadoes, um, thunderstorms, gravity waves, even narrow, uh, heavy snow bands, it's more or less beyond the capability of most models. And that's where observations are really key um, in these time and space scales. This is a typical workstation in a forecast office dealing with some thunderstorms and look at their data. It's, it's satellite data, it's METARs, it's observed data. You don't see a lot of model data on here to try to help you understand where thunderstorms are going to, to develop or go. It's not to say that models aren't useful at all and especially as we evolve to more and more sophisticated models, um, they're really pretty impressive. It's quite impressive to see how far we've come in a short amount of time with modeling convection, but again, if I'm trying to issue a tornado warning or define a flash flood and then communicate that information out, I really need observed data. A few examples I've got, um, and <clears throat> I'm not going to go deep into the details on, on any of these, I, I just have a short amount of time. Actually, Nadia Smith is going to elaborate a lot this afternoon on new caps. Mitch mentioned this. This is a a really impressive technology for us. Uh, we've had satellite sounders in the past that have been marginally useful. I think that we crossed a threshold with these soundings to where um, they're quite a bit more useful and I think that we've found that in these pre-convective environments, um, forecasters are getting a lot of benefit out of them. We did put these to the test in what's called the hazardous weather test bed. I think we're going on our fourth year now and again, um, for the most part, uh, forecasters are finding these quite beneficial. So this comes from the CRIS and the ATMS instruments, provides a skew T sounding uh, retrieval in our AWIPS workstation that we use in the forecast offices. And uh, this is just one case. Um, it worked out pretty well, so I grabbed it for this presentation. And this is actually off of the HWT blog site. So we've got new caps on the left there, and it's showing an inversion 
Again, really important for convection, showing a little bit of a capping inversion there. This is a little bit of a rare case where the HER model, again, this is a pretty good model generally, it did not show the inversion. And um, we were able to launch an 18Z sounding for uh, close to this area, which is somewhat rare, a balloon sounding at 18Z. Um, and this is fairly accurate. So the forecaster really noted that, um, that the, the new cap sounding did show the inversion. The HER, the RAP, and the NAM soundings taken at a similar time, unable to show that. It's also interesting that um, it occurred um, near a, a fire and smoke plume which was correlated to the inversion. Um, so again, just sort of uh, help the forecasters have confidence in that sounding. And I don't show the spatial resolution, um, but Mitch showed all those dots. We get a lot of these, and they come at a really great time. It's, you know, depending on where you're at, somewhere in that early afternoon time frame, which is exactly when we need. It's like having a whole bunch of 18Z soundings, and, and, and that's really when we need them. So really pretty critical. The next example I'm going to show, and again, this is also um, a little more detail from um, uh, an application that Mitch mentioned, and this is the Veers floodwater fraction. Um, this is from a comet module that I highly recommend. It's a, it's a really good module that went through this case. This is from up in Alaska, so the Yukon River. And this is from an ice jam. And what we're seeing there in the colors, it's kind of hard to see in the, on the lower right, but it's the floodwater fraction. So just basically the deeper into the reds you get, um, the more flood water there is. Um, but this is a case where this is almost impossible to model, especially up in Alaska, to be able to model that hydrologic um, impact. Now we're doing a little bit of that in the lower 48 with something called FLASH that NSSL has developed, but it's not up in Alaska and it's highly dependent on radar coverage. This is a, just a 3D visualization, again, from the Comet module to show the terrain and the basin. And there's the ice jam there. And then through time, the water backs up and you really get to see all of that flooding that takes place there. So again, this is something that you're really not gonna predict with a model. You need to be on top of it if you wanna communicate this information out um, to the decision makers. This was the, the result of that ice jam. So it's, it's pretty significant. I've seen a few ice jams you know, in Nebraska, but I've never seen anything like this. This is, this is pretty incredible. Very high impact. Definitely need to observe data to, uh, to provide services with this. And then my last quote, I want to hear from another forecaster here. We I showed the blog post um, that showed uh, the information from the, the forecaster talking about the new cap sounding. And then this is another forecaster that was, actually this was a hydrologist, service hydrologist from the Pacific Northwest that was interviewed and we were interviewing him trying to, to find out what's really important to him when it comes to these um, especially heavy rain situations and, and flooding situations up in his area. And he says here, we get these atmospheric rivers where the core of the heaviest rain is fairly narrow. And the way our basins are laid out, there's a series of them as you go uh, north to south. So they're narrow. And, and the, the whole point of this quote is that if you're off by 50 miles, which the models often are, you're going to have the heavy rain falling in an entirely different basin, and, and you're essentially not going to be able to predict which river is going to flood. So again, critical information that we need from observed data. So hopefully it's a pretty obvious conclusion at this point, um, you know, analyzing and diagnosing what the atmosphere is actually doing, especially during these mesoscale high impact events. Um, is, is we really need observed data for that. Also for comparing what the atmosphere is doing, what we're seeing in the obser observations to what the NWP is doing, that's critical as well. And then again, we really need to be able to communicate that information uh, out to the important decision makers. All right. Thank you. You bet. Thank you, Dan.